This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Thanks, Evan, for that introduction. And Harold Coe, allow me to be the second person in this room to officially welcome you to our Legally Speaking program. Thanks, Marty. Um, as Evan noted, you had just an extraordinary career. Uh, but I'd like to take you back for a moment to 2009. Uh, that was the year that the Senate uh, considered you for the job that you have now. It's also the year that uh, the folks at Fox News, that fair and balanced uh, network, uh, said a lot of things about you that made you sound like a very dangerous and scary person. And, and let me just mention a couple. Uh, they said, for example, that as the legal advisor, you would do everything in your power to impose Sharia law on our courts. Uh, <laughs> They also said, and, and you know I'm not making this up, that because you supported an international convention to eliminate uh, discrimination against women, that you would, if you could, actually get rid of Mother's Day. So uh, my, my, my first question to you, sir, is uh, now that you've been on the job three years, uh, how are those projects going? <laughs> Well, it's a mark of my lack of accomplishment that I've succeeded in neither mission. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a funny story. For, first, on the Mother's Day, um, as you know, there's a convention for the elimination of discrimination against women. It's an international treaty. The United States uh, is absurdly not a party. Uh, but they have a committee uh, that meets in Geneva and reviews different countries. And one of the countries is Belarus, the former uh, Belarusian uh, Republic, um, which uh, broke free as part of the um, uh, fall of the Soviet Empire. And they have a holiday there called Mother's Day, which presents uh, women only as working in the home. Mm. In fact, they cannot work in the workplace. And the Mother's Day in uh, Belarus is a celebration of this uh, stereotypical image. So the, the Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, in reviewing them, said that this was a form of discrimination against women in this form of presentation. Mm. Anyway, um, this got translated to the United States Senate as they're against Mother's Day. And since I supported the convention, I must also be against Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Does, uh, know, does your mother know about this? <laughs> yeah, my mother, so my mother has six children, and she was at my confirmation hearing, and she's sitting there listening to all of these senators saying that I hate my mother, and uh, <laughs> uh, I'm opposed to Mother's Day. And so there's a very funny moment, which is uh, my brother, Howard, is a doctor, and he was also nominated for a job which he's currently holding, Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services. And he was so popular um, that he was actually confirmed without a hearing. <laughs> and I, being the, the bad brother, uh, you know, I got into this big confirmation fight and you know, became this sort of controversial figure. And so my mother says to me, as far as I can tell, one of my sons is an oncologist uh, and the other is a transnationalist. Uh, and it must be that the latter is much more dangerous. <laughs> anyway, I've worked it out with my mother, and she's, she's forgiven. I, I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, were you surprised by the opposition that was mounted against you after President Obama nominated you? Oh, uh, yeah, I was. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little unnerving. Just to bring back some 
terrible memories, we actually have a clip from a Glenn Beck broadcast that I'd like to play. And, and, just, and, and, just, and just to put this in context, this was a few days uh, after your confirmation, and which also happened around the time that the pop singer Michael Jackson died. And Glenn Beck was complaining that the media was paying far <laughs> too much attention to the death of this singer and not nearly enough attention to the fact that the Senate had just confirmed to a very powerful position a man who was going to destroy the American way of life. So let's, let's play that. Hello, America. Michael Jackson, still dead. Here's tonight's hot list. Some common sense solution to where the stories of mainstream media is not doing their job on falling down. Do you remember uh, Harold Coe? He's a guy that uh, New York Times, I think, gave us a lot of heat because we said, oh, look at him. He's a transnationalist. He's the former dean of the Yale Law School, nominated to be the legal advisor for the State Department. He also believes in transnationalism. That is the blending of international and domestic law. Don't like the domestic one? Well, I don't know. What's the rest of the world doing? Maybe we should adopt that one. He was confirmed last week. Didn't hear about it? Oh. Michael Jackson's dead. Just thought you'd like to know the guy who's going to be now negotiating peace treaties and affect international law is a fan of the global legal system. So let's stipulate here at this point that uh, Glenn Beck is a crazy person, uh, or, or at least he does a great job of pretending he's a crazy person. But, but that said, is there an implicit point that he's making there that's not so crazy? And, and that is when you look at the relationship between national sovereignty and international law, isn't it true that whenever you make international law stronger, the privileges and rights that are associated with national sovereignty are inevitably weakened? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, when I was a kid, and I'm sure when you were a kid, Marty, um, if I wanted to go abroad, it would take me months to get a visa. Um, I had to get traveler's checks. Uh, if I wanted, when I was just graduated from college, to travel across Europe, you had to stop at every single border. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many things you couldn't do. Uh, because of international law and treaties that have been negotiated, and we're, we're free. But let's I, mean, I, I, can, I can withdraw money from an ATM machine in Munich, Germany, having flown there the night before on my Schengen visa what freed me was international law. So somehow the notion that sovereignty, uh, that American freedom is threatened by organizing with like-minded countries around common legal principles um, makes about as much sense as saying that California's sovereignty is threatened by being part of a union with Alabama. But what if I want to say mine a Nicaraguan harbor. If international law is strong enough, it's going to stop me, right? Uh, and I think it probably should. <laughs> <laughs> well, with respect to the United States specifically, is there, do you think, a tension to be acknowledged between meeting our international obligations, especially as they pertain to human rights, and the structure of our Constitution? So, so these are principles that are American principles. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the ones who said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal, endowed by their creator a certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We are the ones who embedded those principles along with others into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we, we uploaded these rights from our Bill of Rights into international law. And we promote their spread around the world. We, we meet with the Chinese. We urge that they follow these principles. So uh, this is a spreading of American values as they have been internationalized and accepted by other countries around the common set of principles. So I, I am constantly puzzled by the notion that this is something foreign being imposed on mm -hmm. us. You would acknowledge, though, would you not, that the United States has a complicated relationship with international law and certainly a complicated relationship with the International Criminal Court, right? I mean, um, we're still not a party to it, although I think the tone has certainly changed since uh, Barack Obama became president. 
oh, I think the tone has changed very dramatically. So um, I was in Nuremberg last week, uh, and it was my first time there. I don't, I don't know how many people know that at the very end of the war, Stalin proposed that 50,000 German soldiers be summarily executed. And it was the Americans who pushed for them to be tried mm -hmm. before an international tribunal. And then we dispatched our attorney general, Francis Biddle, to be one of the judges, and um, our justice of the Supreme Court, Robert Jackson. Mm -hmm. And he gave the famous speech where he says, you know, never has power paid greater tribute to reason than for five great nations flushed with victory to stay the hand of vengeance and try them in this setting. So the US government actually favored the concept of an international criminal court. President Clinton actually spoke for one in 1995 at the Dodd Center, the University of Connecticut, because Tom Dodd had been a prosecutor at Nuremberg. But then the US went to Rome and at the last minute did not sign the treaty. But by the end of the Clinton administration, 2000 did sign. And then the Bush administration came in and sent a letter in which they said, we were not bound to not try to defeat the object and purpose of the treaty. Yeah. But what this administration did was we made a couple of basic calculations. First of all, um, the United States had supported every ad hoc tribunal the Yugoslav Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, uh, Sierra Leone, Cambodia, those are phasing out. And the Standing Tribunal, which has 113, 114 states parties, we're opposing? Uh, mm. I mean, how does that make any sense? Yeah. Secondly, even if your only goal is to protect yourself, um, you want to be engaged because you know we had not participated in any meetings. We didn't know any of the players. Yeah. So from the beginning of the administration, we started to attend the meetings. And um, as a result, we have now moved from a policy of hostility to positive engagement. And frankly, I think our relationship with all parties there is very much the better. No laws have been changed. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, if, if you can identify particular individuals who are responsible, that means that you can move for those people to be delegitimated and removed from power, mm -hmm. and you don't have to occupy their country. Yeah. Which, by the way, in an age in which we have a limited hard power, is very useful. L let me ask you this. Uh, when you go to places like Russia or China or Saudi Arabia, and you tell people that they need to do better with their human rights records. And they kind of roll their eyes and, and say to you, uh, Mr. Coe, with all due respect, how can you lecture us on human rights uh, when you represent a country that has the highest incarceration rate in the world, where in spite of your affluence, you have over half a million homeless, and where government officials who have clearly violated the Convention Against Torture enjoy what is, in essence, uh, blanket immunity from prosecution. Uh, what do you think the right response is to that? Americans show exceptional leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no doubt about it. Uh, virtually every important good thing internationally that has happened, virtually every human rights activity has been led by Americans. <laughs> On the other hand, the bad exceptionalism is that we often try to be treated as different or somehow uh, ask for a different standard of evaluation. And what I've noticed is that the more we engage in bad exceptionalism, the more it diminishes our moral capacity to do this kind of exceptional leadership. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very important that, um, and I've served in the government 10 years of my um, professional career. If, if we keep saying America is the problem, America is the problem. We forget the number of times where America is not only the solution, but if America is not the solution, there is no solution. Mm -hmm. there, there is no solution to the Middle East crisis that does not involve America. 
there is no strategy for North Korea uh, returning to the community of nations that doesn't involve American leadership. So the real question is how can America maintain its distinctiveness without moving all the way to double standards? Let's talk a little bit about your background. Your father was a diplomat. Uh, he uh, served as a, uh, a representative of the first democratically elected uh, government of South Korea. Uh, that career ended abruptly uh, when that government was overthrown in a military coup a little over a year after it came to power. Uh, your father decided that instead of serving the regime, he would spend the rest of his life here in exile in the United States. Uh, you were, I guess, what, five, six years old at the time. But uh, as far as you know, was that a difficult decision for him to make? Oh, I think it was. Um, so my father was born to be a great diplomat. Um, and he only got to do it for one year. And he never naturalized. He never became a US citizen, because he always wanted to feel like a Korean. And he endured all kinds of inconveniences. I remember he went through the wrong, the, through the uh, resident alien visa line for the rest of our lives. Um, he taught at a state university. That was a major issue initially because aliens couldn't teach at the university. But <clears throat> the moment that I'll never forget, which was as soon as the night that the government was overthrown. My father was a senior official at the U.S. Embassy, at the Korean Embassy in Washington. They had a meeting in which 50 people gathered, and they took an oath that they would never serve the military regime. Mm -hmm. And my father was the only one who kept that promise. And I asked him once, how do you feel about that? Because the others who broke the promise all became famous ambassadors, prime ministers, et cetera. And he said, you know, there will always be someone in these job, government jobs who's willing to say or do whatever it takes to get those jobs. And so nobody remembers them. And he said, um, on the other hand, the people who had principles and stuck by their principles, people don't care whether they have jobs or not. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to Korea with Madeleine Albright, we met Kim Dae-jung, who was a friend of my father's. And uh, I think this could be the most, maybe the most moving moment of my whole life. Kim Dae-jung had been sentenced to death. He was under house arrest for many years. He was nearly assassinated. But he ended up winning for president, and then he won the Nobel Peace Prize. And when we started the meeting, he suddenly stopped the meeting and said, I'd like to point out the presence of the son of this great Korean hero. Mm. And suddenly it was all worth it. He didn't say he had been prime minister. He didn't say he'd held any government job. But he said this was a man of principle. And I thought, well, you know, he's vindicated. So that made him a very powerful role model, I, uh, I would imagine. But, but then again, you know, I read in an account that he also, as you were getting on in your career, he strongly advised you to keep a low profile, stay away from controversy, don't make waves. <laughs> so I think there were some mixed signals sent there, and, and I'm wondering how you sorted that out. Why? Well, I, I disobeyed him. <laughs> 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 well, you know, what was pretty hilarious was my father was an international lawyer, a professor, and a diplomat. And he encouraged me to be a physicist <laughs> because he thought I would win the Nobel Prize for science. Turned out I was very bad in science. Mm. The first Korean to win the Nobel Prize was a human rights activist. And I ended up as a lawyer, a diplomat, an international <laughs> law professor, just like my dad. Let me track your career a little bit. Uh, you went to uh, Harvard Law School. You clerked for, for uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman. Uh, you then took a job with the Reagan administration as an attorney with the uh, department's Office of Legal Counsel. And among your s assignments, as I understand it, uh, you worked on a brief contesting an international court's review of CIA operations in Nicaragua. You wor also worked on the legal justification for Reagan's invasion of Grenada, which was launched without congressional approval. 
and you came to believe that the man you were working for at the time, uh, Attorney General Edwin Meese, was one of the most dangerous men in America. So would I be going far out on a limb to suggest that your heart wasn't in that job? Yeah, but before that, I had been working in a large law firm where I had the exact same feeling. worse. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, I mean, look, I think I, think, uh, I would say this to law students is um, you really need to know who your clients are. Um, and you better believe in their causes. Um, you know, there are some people who advocate something called the taxi cab principle, <laughs> which is um, it, it's sort of a British barrister's concept. Whoever gets in your taxi, you drive them. Yeah. You know, to be honest, if Paul Pot got into my taxi cab, I'd say take another cab. <laughs> so you became a law professor at Yale after the OLC experience. And uh, in the early 90s, you and a group of law school students at the Lowenstein International Human Rights Clinic, which I understand you co-founded with another human rights attorney named Michael Ratner. Uh, there was a student there named Bill Dodge. <laughs> yeah. It's actually true, and Bill will tell you, Bill and another student um, wanted to start this clinic. And they came to my office and asked me to be their faculty advisor. And I said, you know, are you crazy? I, I, I just got tenure. I said, I'm too busy to do it. And then he showed up again. Mm -hmm. And then they, they sort of maneuvered me into the situation where, could I just supervise one case? And I said, I'll do that, you know, 20,000 hours later. <laughs> uh, Is this the Haiti case? We did a whole series of cases. Yeah. We did uh, alien tort cases. We right. did the Haitian refugee cases. But I enjoyed it. I mean, the truth was that um, uh, it was a way that I could work with students as friends. Yeah. And um, to me, it was very similar to what it's like to work in the government with younger lawyers. You know, yeah. you, you get a chance to you know, work as a team. It's really fun. Well, the case that I know about was the case that became a book called Storming the Court, which is a wonderful book, and I recommend it highly. But in that case, you were fighting for the legal rights of thousands of refugees who, in these rickety boats, had fled Haiti after a vicious military coup. And, and one of the key legal questions uh, that you were uh, uh, raising was whether or not two United States presidents uh, President George H.W. Bush and then Bill Clinton had violated both international and federal law when they ordered the United States Navy to pick these refugees off their boats out on the high seas and without any screening process whatsoever return them to Haiti where they obviously faced you know, serious danger. Uh, you took that case all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, in fact, you made the oral arguments in that case. Uh, I think you had the law on your side. Uh, you certainly had morality on your side, and yet you lost that case eight to one. Uh, so uh, what's the moral of that particular story? Uh, well, there was a very important moment, which was when I was doing the moot court for that case. Um, one of the issues in the case was collateral estoppel, which is a civil procedure doctrine. And I was asked a question about it, and I gave a long professorial answer. Mm -hmm. And a civil rights lawyer who was mooting me said, if you waste your time talking about that, you've missed the issue, which is a justice issue. And he said, the second the argument is over, you walk out onto the front steps of the Supreme Court, walk to the cameras, and start talking about the injustice of this policy which I did, and while I was out there, they said, we'd like you to be on the news hour. And as I was going to the news hour, somebody said, guess what? This is the oral argument. Mm. I mean, we knew we were going to lose at the court. We didn't know whether we lose 9, 0, 8, 1, or 5-4. Or we, we knew we didn't have the votes. But we knew that if we could put pressure on the policy, it could get changed. And in fact, it was changed. Mm -hmm. Clinton changed the policy in 1994. So, and by the way, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, the European Court of Human <coughs> Rights issued the opposite ruling on the same set of issues as, as Richard Boswell does. So I think the bottom line here is you measure victories by 
outcomes, and those outcomes take a while to play out. I mean, this is a common theme. You know, my father thought his life was over because he couldn't serve in the government. 30 years later, I'm sitting there with a human rights activist who is now president of his country telling me my father is viewed as a Korean hero. So my father won. He wasn't there to see it, but he did. In that book, Storming the Court, uh, it, it said that you uh, made a, a special play for Justice Scalia's vote. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, that obviously begs the question, why in the world did you think you had a chance with Scalia? <laughs> because the text was clear. OK. <laughs> so we, we, were counting, we were counting on um, his theory of statutory interpretation to actually be followed by him in that vote. And so we were sadly disappointed. Let's uh, fast forward a bit and talk about some of the recent issues that you've had to deal with uh, as legal advisor to the, for the State Department. And, and let's begin with drones. Uh, President Obama has, by all accounts, used these extraordinary weapons to decimate the leadership of Al Qaeda. And it's very, very hard to feel bad about that. Uh, but, but let me ask you this, um, what's the, um, as a matter of international law, what is the essential difference between, say, attaching a sticky bomb to the car of an Iranian scientist and blowing it up, which is what Israeli agents are very strongly suspected of doing, and which our own State Department has strongly condemned, uh, versus what we are doing, which is to drop from 30,000 feet these Hellfire missiles on suspected terrorists in places that are far removed from established battlefields in countries that we are not at war with. Well, there's a lot there. Number one, we are in an armed conflict with Al Qaeda, which is a non-state actor. Uh, Al Qaeda is an organized force and it has senior leaders. And Many of those senior leaders have long and documented histories of attacking uh, U.S. citizens on U.S. soil, including involvement in 9-11 and other similar kinds of attacks. Now, uh, that is the frame. So let me make it clear. I did not come to the government because I wanted to work on killing people. On the other hand, all killing is regrettable, but not all killing is illegal. And in the context of the law of war, it is the laws of war that draw the line between lawful and unlawful killing. So the example you gave, Israel is not in a state of war with Iran, so far as I know. But Israel considers these, uh, this nuclear uh, program to be an existential threat. So. Uh, I, I, could, I would imagine that Israeli citizens would, many Israeli citizens would see a, a necessity to taking these scientists out, at least as necessary as us taking these suspected terrorists out. So, so let's go to our conflict with Al Qaeda. The United States Supreme Court has called it a non-international armed conflict. So that's a ruling by our highest court. The Congress of the United States, with the signature of the president, uh, authorized the use of military force against senior al-Qaeda leaders. And then the question is, can the president con conduct that with a high degree of precision? Now, uh, warfare over time has involved less precise weapons. But the story of the evolution of military weapons is to enable more precise remote targeting, whether it's arrows or catapults or bombs or <coughs> drones. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is, was it lawful after Pearl Harbor for the US high command to target the Japanese general who launched the attack on Pearl Harbor? I believe it was. It's consistent with the laws of war. Was it consistent with the laws of war for the president of the United States to authorize an attack against the person who himself claimed responsibility for killing 3,000 innocent people in U.S. soil on 9-11. It is a similar kind of situation. This year, a Newsweek correspondent, David Claydman, uh, published a book called Kill or Capture, The War on Terror and the Soul of the Obama Presidency. Did, did you happen to read it? 
Uh, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> anyway, there's, a, there's one passage that I'd like to read to you in which he describes the mindset that he says that you were in roughly six months into your tenure as a legal advisor. Uh, Clayman writes, quote, at Yale, Coe had memorized the names and faces of his students, bright-eyed idealists who wanted to use the law to improve the world. Now he was studying government hit lists, memorizing the profiles of young, vacant-eyed militants, and helping to determine which ones could be put to death. Coe wondered, how did I go from being a law professor to someone involved in killing? End of quote. Um, does, does Clydman in that passage accurately, accurately describe what you were thinking and feeling then? Well, clearly he's inferred stuff about my thought processes, but it, but it is true that you're, uh, put yourself in my shoes. I, I'm the lawyer for the State Department. My job is to ensure that U.S. activity uh, complies with international law. The way that you can determine that is to determine whether persons are lawful targets. And therefore, and, th and these people are not going to receive a trial because target lists and military campaigns are not subject to judicial review. They've never been. The due process they're going to get is from me. And whether that should be the way it is or not, that's my job. So I have to be absolutely sure before uh, I participate in some decision that the person poses a genuine threat to U.S. interests. And that requires I know every bit as much about that person as I knew about students I was trying to teach and help. And it's, it's a fairly shocking thing to realize. I mean, there was one suspect who we were following, who was the exact, born in the exact same day as my daughter. And I read this person's dossier, and I remembered what my daughter was doing on a particular day when she was 10 years old. And that was the day this guy was recruited. And on the day she celebrated some birthday was the day that he killed his first other child soldier. I mean, it just tells you about the tragedy of our lives, that um, not everybody gets the same set of nature and nurture. But what would people want? I mean, I, I would be delighted if this was not uh, something that I was uh, asked to do in these settings. But on the other hand, if, I'm, if this is the job that somebody has to do, it might as well be me, and I should do it to the very best of my ability. So I devoted many, many hours to it. And um, you know, when I'm done, somebody else can do it. Mm -hmm. Or the whole process can be changed. And there's obviously a, a process we would like to move to that uh, I think many people in this administration would, would be interested in exploring. But for now, um, you know what they say. Uh, this, is, this is the profession we've chosen. And you, you've got to do the very best you can. As well as you've done that job, and as just as this war is that uh, this administration is waging, do you worry about the precedents that are being set? I mean, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's very likely that the future presidents will not be as up to speed on just war theories as this president is. Um, and, 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 and for that matter, uh, other countries are going to be inevitably developing this technology. Are the precedents being set in this administration uh, going to bite us down the road? Well, I think it, it's a function of several things. Um, the legal standards that we establish, the transparency of those, the bureaucratization of those rules in a process that have a set of internal checks and balances. Um, I personally believe a fair number of the press accounts have been very helpful in terms of clarifying exactly how, much, how seriously these things are, are done. And um, you know, we do have very strict classification rules. You know, I mean, people are being prosecuted for violations of these rules. Secrets are not mine to give away. Um, you take oaths, you sign documents. 
So <coughs> um, I think, do I worry about where this is going to end up? Yes. Um, is it where I want it to be right now? No. Do I have some confidence that with enough care and attention it will get there in time? Yes. And so that's why the project, as painful as it is, is important. I mean, I think what's confusing people is that the, both the nature of the enemy we're fighting and the yeah. nature of the weapons we're using to fight that enemy terribly blurs the line between fighting a war and fighting crime. And, uh, and I think that's why uh, this administration, like the last one for that matter, for that matter keeps getting tied up in knots over this, uh, this idea of due process. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, Attorney General Holder. He gave a speech in which he made a distinction between judicial process and due process. And you know, some of our targets are, uh, if they're American citizens, uh, should get due process, but not judicial process. But how can it be due process if, in the end, the president is serving as judge, jury, and executioner? Well, we're in a law school here where everybody knows about Matthews versus Eldridge and due process as administered by the administrative state. And there's a the strength of the private interest, the strength of the public interest, and the risk of error, and whether the procedures being applied guarantee and protect the private interest. And executive officials do that every single day, and it's being done in this context as well. And this is a very novel situation because there's an effort to do this in the context of armed conflict. Um, so when George Washington targeted British redcoat leaders who he thought were leading forces to be killed by Mel Gibson, <laughs> or, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't publish those target lists, and they didn't run them by a court either. Yeah. Um, so the question is, how do you preserve fairness and process in the context of armed conflict situations? And that's, that's the, the, the complicated translation exercise that's going on here. And it's, it's very difficult to do it perfectly, I, I agree. But that doesn't mean that good faith efforts in that regard aren't being done. Mm -hmm. Of all the targeted killings that we've read about, uh, the one, of course, that's generated the most controversy was the uh, killing of Anwar Alaki, uh, an American citizen living in Yemen. Uh, well before Alaki was actually killed, uh, the press had reported that he was on a hit list. And it was in that context that his father, Nasser Alaki, also an American citizen, went in the court demanding that this administration present its rationale for why his son was on a hit list. And the administration's response, in essence, was that this was none of the court's business, that uh, the father had no standing, and that the questions being raised were political questions, and therefore non-justiciable. Would you have been comfortable making that argument in that court to, to this man's father? If Admiral Yamamoto, who launched the Pearl Harbor attack, were an American dual national, would he be allowed to go into a US court and get a restraining order that would allow him to keep attacking the United States but not bar him from acting? So I mean, the court, by the way, ruled against the plaintiff. Right. And um, it was a very good judge. Right. Both sides were well represented. But, but the judge was seemed troubled. I and mean, he made the point that you, know, you need a judicial order to, uh, get, uh, to, to order up electronic surveillance of someone. And here, the administration was saying that no judicial review was necessary to kill someone. I mean, the judge was obviously troubled, was he not? We're in an armed conflict situation in which the question is whether the decisions that are being made by one group of combatants against the other is subject to judicial review, and whether one of the people who claims to be a target can get a restraining order from a court to prevent that armed conflict from going on, and the court dismissed. I actually think, as a matter of law, I, I, whoever, in that context, I had exactly the same view of this going back to the beginning of my legal career. Mm -hmm. 
In the mid-1990s, uh, you wrote a law review article entitled Protecting the OLC Against Itself. And, and in that, you argued, I thought rather convincingly, that the legal opinions of the Office of Legal Counsel uh, should be made public, uh, not just for the benefit of the public, but also for the benefit of this office, which uh, has an, uh, an understandable eagerness to give the president what, it, what he wants and in the process perhaps compromise the integrity of the office. Uh, do you still believe that? Most of them are public. If you go on the DOJ website, there they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they are, you can find them. And many of the most controversial ones have been declassified. So I believe that, and I think it's actually happened. But, but when the administration says, we can't confirm or deny that we have an OLC opinion in a vault somewhere on this Alaki thing, um, isn't that a little silly? Every organization I've ever been in, Marty, and I'm sure yours too, like, I, I could ask you, how did you come to write the California lawyer, lawyer story about X, Y, or Z? Or who are your sources? Every organization will come to a point where they say that is a confidential process. We need that confidentiality to do our work. In the case of much of what I do, that those rules of classification are both mandated by legislation and enforced by criminal penalties. I'm not free to waive them on my own. The fact that someone leaks something doesn't declassify them. So those are the rules you operate under when you go into the government. I mean, I'd be delighted if um, um, you could join the government and then make a bunch of commitments and then just ignore them to make yourself look good, but unfortunately that's not the case. But everybody knows that OLC opinion exists. Uh, the New York Times is sued to release it. Uh, can you give us any hint at all as to why they, they, <laughs> this administration can't, you know, release it? Well, first of all, that, not, that is not an opinion of the State Department legal advisor. Right. right, right, right. If it was my opinion, I'd push to get it released, but it's, uh, it's not my opinion. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me read to you a quote from Michael Hayden, who was the last CIA director under uh, George W. Bush. He said, quote, this drone program rests on the personal legitimacy of the president and that it is not sustainable. I have lived the life of someone taking action on the basis of secret OLC memos, and it ain't a good life. Democracies do not make war on the basis of legal memos locked in a DOJ safe. He does have a point, doesn't he? Well, um, people serve in these positions, and they do the best they can do in their positions. I'm interested to know what he did when he was in office, and I'm interested in his view now. You published a book called The National Security Constitution, uh, in which you warned, I thought very persuasively, actually, against the dangers of uh, the imperial presidency, especially when it comes to launching uh, military action without congressional uh, approval. Uh, having spent the last three years in this administration as legal advisor, have your views on the powers of the presidency and the dangers that those powers pose, have, have they changed? No, because I think that the executive branch can still overreach. On the other hand, I think there's a robust system of internal checks and balances. Um, my view is not the legal view of the U.S. government. It's reviewed and evaluated by, uh, by lawyers from across the executive branch. I mean, by the way, one question nobody asks on these um, drone questions is, why is the State Department's legal advisor deeply engaged on these issues? Uh, I'm supposed to be the diplomat. You could imagine some environment in which I was excluded from this, but that's not the case. So there's a rigorous system of internal checks and balances at play. Yeah. And people fight each other over these legal opinions um, uh, with the most sophisticated and principled legal arguments that they can muster. And that's much of what we do. Uh, briefs that are filed are vetted by hundreds of lawyers and very, very carefully uh, worked over. So but, Yeah, but as rigorous as that is, it is a, it is a closed system. And, and, and that's a concern. I mean, uh, for George Tenet, it was a slam dunk that there were weapons of mass destruction uh, in Iraq. So uh, 
the idea, and this has been proposed uh, many times by other people, of a, of a FISA-like court uh, taking a, you know, looking over your guy's shoulders. Uh, doesn't that make sense? I'm glad you mentioned that because that was a almost two-year process of legislation that was led by Attorney General Ed Levy immediately post Watergate with the support and cooperation of Ted Kennedy. Dozens of hearings were held. Groups on all sides of the issue were heard. And there was a very thoughtful legislative process. And I'd like to ask you, Marty, name one piece of national security legislation on which a comparable process has been held in the last 15 years. Um, most legislative hearings have stopped. National security legislation has uh, pretty much given way to appropriations riders. And we have a kind of gridlock where we can't come up with a budget. We can't protect our um, credit rating. We can't do all kinds of things in the right. legislative process. So uh, would I like a thoughtful, intelligent, well-reasoned, non-ideological process? Yes. Um, do I see institutions currently existing that are going to produce that? You answer that for me. Yeah, I mean, you have a dysfunctional Congress. So is the answer to that uh, an imperial presidency? No, the answer to that is a presidency that respects the rule of law, that vigorously enforces that with internal checks and balances, that has people who fight as hard internally for the rule of law and hope that the time comes when the kinds of processes that are created can be embodied into legislation and passed by responsible legislators, signed by presidents, and subjected to judicial review by thoughtful judicial institutions. Well, let's talk about Libya. Um, you know, uh, on that occasion, uh, the president uh, got what I thought was a lot of well-deserved credit for avoiding a human rights disaster. Um, but there was this concern that in doing the right thing, uh, he also violated uh, the War Powers Act of 1973. And you were a point man in that debate. Uh, you appeared before the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Foreign Relations Committee last year. And your argument, in essence, was that the military actions that this administration was taking uh, did not meet the legal definition of the word hostilities as it was used uh, in the statute? Uh, there were no ground troops. The United States was acting pursuant to Security Council resolution. We're in a backup role. The amount of ordinance that was used was 1% of what was used in Kosovo, and it worked. Mm -hmm. Qaddafi's gone. Thousands of Libyans are alive who were about to be slaughtered in Benghazi. Congress didn't act. But on the other hand, uh, if they had wanted to act, they were free to do so. And if the precedent is invoked with the same set of constraints in the future, I would defend it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's 100% right. Um, some senators disagree, but you know that's life. It's hard not to applaud the result. but. Uh I recall that in that book you wrote in 1990, uh, you said that President Reagan had violated the spirit, if not the letter, of the War Powers Act of 1973 when he did an airstrike in Libya. Yeah, let me give you an example, Marty, which is, <laughs> let's go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? OK. I, re I mentioned the Reagan example only because it's the same country. No, but this is a better attack. example. This is okay. a better example, OK? okay. <laughs> <laughs> there are missiles in Cuba? Yeah. <laughs> There are some bad options. What are they? Ground troops. We just had the Bay of Pigs. You know, unilateral nuclear attack or do nothing. Those are the three choices, right? Right. So what did the administration do? Through the ingenuity of people like the legal advisor, Abe Chase, we did a quarantine. Was it a blockade? A blockade is an act of war, violates or sets forward the basis of that. The United States went away from the illegal options and also went away from the do-nothing option, yeah. chose an option. And now, although it was incredibly controversial at the time, the option chosen, which was a quarantine, is considered to be both some, 
thing that led to the successful outcome of the Cuban Missile Crisis? No question. No question. But uh, a precedent was set. And, 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 I, and I'm happy to have that precedent followed there and here. So, I mean, in law you learn about, um, we did not call for the unconstitutionality of the War Powers Resolution. We said that an interpretation that was consistent with precedent was this. Yeah. And if those uh, highly unusual facts recur, that precedent would be available subject to its constraints. So I mentioned the Libya example with respect to Reagan only because it's the same country, an attack that probably lasted an hour. You said in your 1990 book uh, was a violation. The Reagan, the Reagan um, War Powers Resolution applies to things that take longer than 60 days. So things that fall within an hour don't fall within the scope of the War Powers Resolution. But you the said they did. Uh, you, uh, let me read to you a quote here. Uh, Let's see. Here. Marty, if you want to get stuff I wrote before, <laughs> All right. you better get it right. Um, <laughs> let's see, yeah. Well, let's see. I, I had yeah. made a simple point, yeah. which is that the War Powers Resolution is a gimmick. Hmm. Right. Because what we would want is for Congress and the President to talk about when to go to war, and that a deadline is supposed to force people to talk. And the deadline, if it's automatically triggered, sometimes gets people to talk and sometimes it doesn't. But if your goal is to actually have consultation, you should actually have consultation. And that one of the most strange things about the War Powers Resolution is it allows troops to be put in for 60 to 90 days, Yeah. but says nothing about when they should be put in in the first place. That's what I said there and that's what I say now. I, you know. I went back, I mean, I'm not going to put out a rationale without reading my past work on this. Mm -hmm. And I, there's absolutely no inconsistency between anything I wrote before and what is there. Well, let me read you a quote. And then <laughs> just so, just so I, the hat, now I, that I found it. And, and I'm going to read you some quotes from California lawyer. Oh, don't do that. No, no, no. I've done, <laughs> I've done research on California lawyer. Oh, you have. Post wrote, you wrote five years ago, yeah. and I'm going to read you a sentence that suggest that you're not telling me the truth now. To which and, I don't, and, I don't, and I don't, you know, the, the thrust of my questions is not to suggest that you're not telling the truth, but there has been an, I'm wondering if there's been an evolution. Because when you're looking at, a, at a, 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 an attack that lasts an hour, and you're saying, and you're, you're saying that that's legally problematic, or you did say that back in 1990, and now you're saying that a, a, an operation that lasted over 60 days uh, was not legally prob problematic. That suggests to me at least the possibility that there's been an evolution in your thinking on the War Powers Act. No, I think there's been an evolution of practice of war powers. So, so for example, mm -hmm. is the only way that you're going to enter international agreement by a treaty? Yeah. Uh, advising consent to do by two thirds. If so, the NAFTA is unconstitutional. What's been an evolution is the practice and how these things are done, which has been blessed by all three branches of government, and therefore has acquired a kind of lawful status, although it's never been formally adjudicated by the U.S. Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And um, in the war powers areas, there's been a similar set of practices that have been acquiesced in by Congress, accepted by the courts, adopted by the president, staying within certain constraints, and that's formed a kind of custom in this area. That custom could be overridden by a Supreme Court decision or by formal legislation, but it hasn't. That's exactly the theory of the book. Yeah. I mean, do you think that the War Powers Act, uh, you, you describe it as a gimmick. Do you think it still has value? I think a War Powers Resolution that doesn't adjust to humanitarian intervention mm. or situations where use of force subject to a multinational Security Council resolution isn't what they were talking about in 1970, right? right? In 1973, they were talking about creeping wars yeah. with lots of ground troops, lots of American casualties that build and become impossible to withdraw, right? Mm -hmm. No more Vietnams. Right. <laughs> they were not talking about let's have more Rwandas. Let's have more mm -hmm. Serbanitsas. That's not what they were talking about. We just have a, a few more minutes, and I, and I thought I would use the time to uh, ask you about the legal implications of our ongoing standoff with Iran. 
Uh, let's just suppose for a, a moment that uh, over the next few months, Iran comes right up to the line of violating the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but is very careful not to cross that line in any you know, unambiguous, blatant way. And let's say that uh, Israel at, at, at some point nevertheless launches a, a preemptive strike against Iran uh, with, the, with the coordination of the United States. Would Israel uh, and the United States be on the right side of international law? Well, that's a lot of hypotheticals there, Marty. Uh, I mean, the, the truth of it is that the issue is being addressed through a combination of multilateral sanctions and a P5 plus one process in which the UN is participating. And that process is going to continue. And, um, um, you know, a lot of people love to jump to, I mean, here, here's the thing is that I, I'm very struck by how many people assume that the solution of choice is always military. When in fact, what we've done here is almost entirely diplomatic, what Hillary Clinton calls smart power. Uh, there's no proof that a smart power approach has failed. In fact, it seems from my perspective have kept things exactly uh, in the kind of constrained circumstance they ought to be. So I think um, it's working and we should just keep doing what we can. Is it all relevant to the question that I just asked, that back in 1981, uh, when Ronald Reagan was president, uh, the United States, along with every other country on the UN Security Council, voted unanimously to condemn Israel when it attacked uh, Iraq's nuclear, the, the reactor that Iraq was building. Is that a strong precedent in, in, this, in, in this discussion? Well, the you know, Iraq reactor is a very uh, I mean, it's a particular historical precedent. Um, I think we're talking about a, a quite different set of facts at the moment and quite a different predicate. Um, I mean, you've heard every official of this administration say that they want to exhaust other mechanisms, and that's essentially what we're doing. My colleagues at the State Department, we, we don't have guns, Marty. <laughs> You know, we don't send our people, uh, but by the way, they do go into the most dangerous situations with no protection. Right. And what they do is they try to use diplomacy, law, uh, negotiating skills, and reason to achieve outcomes that can't be achieved by hard power. And my fervent hope is that will succeed in this case as well. Last question. You, you've spent a, a good part of your career in academia. You've uh, spent a good deal of your uh, career in government. Which would you say is the more surreal place to work? <laughs> um, no, they're, they're equally surreal. <laughs> uh, look, I'm a lucky guy. I'm a lucky guy. I, um, if you had told me back when I was a law student that I had a chance to do any of the things I've done, any one of them. I mean, you listed a bunch of them. I would have said, come on. Mm. The one thing I did not anticipate was that I'd have a chance to do all of them and still have some time left. Here's I, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, I have come to admire those baseball players who throw the knuckleball because they just get up there and keep throwing it up there until they're in their 50s. And their goal is sustained mediocrity. That's my own ambition as well. <laughs> I, I love the game. I just want to keep playing the game, whether it's academia, whether it's government. I'm lucky to have had the chance. My, my father got to play the game for six months a year. Hmm. And he was as talented as anybody. But he was in a situation where he could not serve the values he loved and do the job he wanted. And I've had the opposite experience. So I was given an opportunity he was denied. So I'd, I'd love to just keep throwing up that knuckleball for the rest of my life. Harold Cole, thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. <laughs>